Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Test Bro channel. Today I'm going to do something that's not just a little outside my usual area, something that's way outside my usual area. Because usually I speak about science fiction, particularly steampunk or history. This time I'm going to talk about prehistory in a book that came out way back in 1997. It's a fascinating book, and it's nonfiction, and it won several awards, including a Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction and the Adventist Prize for best science book. Now, I read this when it first came out, and I have a paper copy of it somewhere in my library, and I didn't quite get through it. But later, I thought about that book, and I thought, I want to finish it. So I got the audiobook, I finished it, and I was glad I did. It's a fascinating book. The name is Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond and published by W.W. Norton. Now, the whole premise behind Guns, Germs, and Steel is to propose answers to the question, why did some human societies become dominant while others were conquered or even wiped out? What enabled small Western nations, such as Britain, to dominate huge portions of the globe? Uh, the author, Jared Diamond, he has some fascinating insights and hypotheses about why this might be. But first, I'm going to comment briefly on the requirements of skepticism. One thing I learned early on was that a lot of popular nonfiction books can lay out a really good cause for something and be total bunk. <laughs> My example is a work called Church of the Gods by Eric Von Donegan, which I read as a teenager. It has all these cool ideas about how space aliens came down to Earth and they gave humans all this crazy technology. And because of that, our ancestors worshipped them as gods. And he had all these examples like, this looks like a spaceship. This looks like something else. Kind of reinterpreting but he's very selective. <laughs> and when you read the books that debunk him, you realize how dishonest he was. For example, there's a uh, picture of the Nazca drawings, which is in Peru, these giant drawings on this barren plain. And this picture looks like landing bays of aircraft. It's like, like this, like three fingers. And he says, this looks like where they went and landed spacecraft. No, it's actually part of the claw of a giant bird. <laughs> <laughs> he cropped the picture selectively. So after that, I became a little bit more skeptical, let's say. So I have to approach things like Guns, Germs, and Steel, as popular as it was, and the fact that it wins awards, I have to approach that a bit skeptically too, in particular because Jared Diamond is not a paleontologist. He's not an anthropologist. He is an ornithologist. That is, he's a bird scientist. That doesn't mean he can't have good ideas outside his field, but it makes it a little bit more suspect. Uh, but anyway, because he studies birds, he spent a lot of time in New Guinea. It's a huge island just north of Australia. And New Guinea is tropical, it's rugged, and has many, many ecosystems where all these hundreds of species of birds evolved there and they live nowhere else. So great place for a bird scientist to be. And while Diamond was there, he met a lot of the locals. Well, the locals were people who were formerly like headhunters. You know, their ancestors 100 years back were headhunters. And uh, they practiced things like ritual cannibalism <laughs> and so on. Didn't know any better. You know, and when Westerners came in, they said, you know, some of this might be causing disease. You better stop it. <laughs> and they learned to read and write and all that stuff. So... This one friend of his was a guy named Yali, who is a, I guess, a notable politician in the brand new nation of Papua New Guinea. And uh, he and Diamond had a lot of interesting discussions. And one day Yali said, you know, you white people have a lot of cargo and we don't. Why is that? Well, when, by cargo, he means technological goods, all these, this cornucopia of stuff that came in from the outside. 
And the term came from World War II when there was all these soldiers coming in from Japan and from America. They were making bases and they brought in radios and airplanes and medicines and all this stuff that the natives had never seen before. It looked like magic to them. And they, they called them all cargo because it came in on a cargo plane. <laughs> so, yeah, we had a very good question. And uh, Diamond thought about that. He said, wow, you know, I never thought about that before. Let's explore how that might have been. First off, he rejected the traditional argument, which ones the Victorians would have surely made was that, well, it's plainly because Europeans are superior. <laughs> uh, but uh, he wanted to look for scientific explanations of why it would be. He had a lot of interesting observations uh, concerning environment and how environment shaped human societies and made it possible for some to develop disciplines uh, disciplined civilizations and others not to. And that was the genesis of this very fascinating book. Now, personally, I take issue with the notion that you have to reject all idea of differing abilities uh, just because the Victorians were wrong about a lot of things. You know, they were certainly wrong about the idea that uh, primitive cultures were promiscuous in sexual matters. In general, that's not true. They have more taboos than we do. But on the other hand, who knows? I mean, some cultures have, you know, better adaptations to different, different uh, conditions. Some cultures, people tend to be more cooperative than others, especially in East Asia, for example. And there may have been something in their past that make them this way. And so I don't think one should reject those possibilities outright. Diamond, I think, feels like it would be racist to argue anything of the sort. So, in fact, he wants to argue the opposite, that perhaps New Guineans are smarter than Europeans. And he has sort of a anecdotal way to illustrate that, which didn't, in my view, have a lot of validity. I'm not saying it's not true. It just wasn't scientific. But I'll get back to that later. Now, in his quest to explain the mystery of why whites had cargo and New Guineans did not, Diamond reaches way back to the prehistory of mankind, to the origins of writing, of agriculture, of uh, built-up cities with their stone buildings, and political organization and empires. He argues, with a lot more credibility than Von Danigan did, uh, that uh, this is why some civilizations rose and became prominent. There's no aliens involved <laughs> in this book. All human societies are similar in a couple ways. We all have spoken language, and we all use basic technologies such as weapons and fire, even the most primitive. Uh, even the Andaman Islanders who were isolated off the coast of Burma. Uh, but why did some peoples develop writing and the wheel and others did not? Uh, didn't these basic innovations, you know, wasn't that something anybody should have thought of? Or did they occur very sporadically, very rare, these kind of ideas, and then they spread? <laughs> That's what Diamond says, that they are very rare, that these insights are. And they're not random either, though, because to have ideas and technology, you have to have some kind of a lifestyle that's above subsistence. You can't be hungry all the time. You can't be wandering all the time. You have to have the ability to settle down and have some people specialize in things like metallurgy, for example, you know, or, you know, woodcrafting or whatever. Societies who develop that early, who settle down early, are the ones who have an advantage later on. As Diamond sees it, there are a small number of environmental factors that make all the difference. And that's a big thing in science. A lot of very small factors can make a, a big difference. I mean, you have marsupial mammals in Australia, but almost none anywhere else, because placental mammals, that is like us, that bear their young to full term, they have a slight advantage. And thus, most of the marsupials died out. So these advantages don't have to be major. Now, the three-part title refers to three factors, guns, germs, and steel. First is, I think, technology, the kind of technology that enables one society to dominate another. <laughs> but it's only possible when you're above subsistence. 
you can't be melting down metal and mixing up gunpowder when you're trying to survive. The second is about infectious diseases, or more correctly, about resistance to them. Some people were in contact with more other cultures, they caught more different diseases, and they got some immunity. And some other isolated people did not have this. Thirdly, we have steel, which refers to natural resources. There are resources that are available in one land and not another, and that's why uh, trade evolved way back in the ancient world. I mean, there were tin mines in Cornwall in England, and you know, ancient Phoenicians would sail all the way around the Atlantic coast just to get tin ore, uh, because you know they had to find it where where it was. If you don't have tin ore, you don't develop tin. You know. So uh, these factors were a big deal for other uh, for other societies that didn't have them, and places like the Americas, for example, where people didn't have smallpox and measles until the Europeans brought them, and then they died in droves. So this was a, an advantage the Europeans had that they didn't even realize. One of the more interesting and perhaps controversial ideas that Diamond proposes is that climactic zones and continental axes are very important. Geography explains, in his view, why some continents are much better than others for civilization. At the top of the heap is Eurasia, where us Europeans, where East Asians, you know, the Chinese came from, where Indians came from, where Arabs came from, or all these peoples. Because it's the biggest continent, it's got 37% of the world's land mass. Over the millennia, it had at least a dozen advanced civilizations arising in that place, from the islands of Greece to the rivers of China. Its advantages included the largest area with a temperate climate suited for agriculture. Because Eurasia is so huge, there were numerous plants and animal species available for humans to domesticate as sources of food, clothing, transportation, and security. That's why we have dogs. That's what they were. Laymen who don't know a lot about biology, myself included, might have thought, well, gee, shouldn't it be easy to domesticate anything like a zebra? <laughs> shouldn't we be able to take any old wild plant like the dandelion? We know we can eat dandelions. Shouldn't we be able to make that into a crop? It doesn't work that way. <laughs> a lot of things just aren't suited. A lot of animals can't be effectively domesticated. Therefore, when a crop like wheat comes around that's, uh, that's amazing, it spreads you know, throughout Eurasia, or the horse. And people are riding them all over the place on the steppes of Mongolia. And because you can walk from one end to another, that's why these things all get spread in this huge continent. And the temperate zone is like 10,000 miles long. So if you can grow wheat in Spain, you can also grow it in China. Other continents, such as Africa and Australia, they have... Uh, super rainy zones, they have super dry zones, and they have very small temperate areas which are very, very isolated from others. So they might have had just one crop that they could develop, <laughs> and not this plethora like we Eurasians did. The Americans had even more trouble because besides having only two isolated temperate zones, they had no huge animals to speak of. And that involves the history of their settlement. Because when people came over during the Ice Age, these animals, these big mammoths, these ground sloths, uh, these uh, saber-toothed tigers, they didn't know people. They didn't know how dangerous people were. And these skilled hunters were able to kill them all. <laughs> they were to wipe them out. And they weren't yet to the stage where they were going to settle down and say, let's tame the mammoth, for example. Let's use him to bear loads. No. By the time they thought about it, it was too late. So the Americans only domesticated two animals, the llama and the guinea pig. And thus, they didn't have that advantage of having, you know, horses to ride and cattle for subsistence. So... This is all pretty fascinating stuff, and if you're not well-versed in the science and biology, 
and so on, you're really going to learn a lot here. I mean, apparently, or obviously, he did a lot of research that we can benefit from from reading this book. And the history of agriculture is amazing. You know, did you know, for example, that wild almonds are poisonous? Whatever possessed people to breed a non-poisonous version? You would think this was not one of the ones that was particularly suited, but I guess there was a mutation that wasn't poisonous and it was delicious. So people bred those. One of my favorite snacks, by the way. And so I'm sure, though, that there are a lot of factors that have changed since he first wrote this book, but nonetheless, it was pretty groundbreaking at the time. Guns, Germs, and Steel spent several chapters on agriculture, and this is the part that might get a little dull for people, including myself, and I grew up on a farm, so I knew a lot about, you know, growing food. But yet, it's something that was very important to civilization. And so, a lot of fascinating stuff. I love this stuff. I love uh, knowing, you know, what DNA says about these ancient, you know, bone samples and so on. And this is something that was just starting to come into pro prominence when Jer Jared Diamond first wrote this book. And since then, we've learned even more. And so the ideas about continental axes and so on, I don't know if he had those ideas himself or if he was just repeating them, but they're kind of groundbreaking. There's one area, though, where Diamond does not challenge orthodoxy at all. And that's the contention that human groups are all fundamentally the same in innate behaviors and abilities. Here is where we come back to a stated goal, which is to say why some nations produce more cargo and some produce practically none. And he has a moral objection to saying that some people might be smarter than others, to be blunt about it. Um, but, you know, the fact that he finds this um, objectionable uh, finds the idea repugnant, it doesn't mean it couldn't be true. I mean, it might be. I mean, to argue that one group or another has different, you know, behavioral ideas, there's nothing that forbids that. Uh, there's nothing that states either that we have to be Nazis just because we think it might be true. You know, like Richard Dawkins, who wrote The Selfish Gene, and to uh, talk about how much genetics influences human behavior, he didn't say that we should, you know, be survival of the fittest type type societies. No, he wants socialism. He wants people to take care of other people. So you don't have to let it inform your politics. Now, it's dangerous to talk about genetics in this day and age because it can get you branded as some sort of a historical, you know, Aryan supremacist, but it just it just doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't talk about these things. And even though the social sciences are dominated by the left, that's not a good thing. We need to have more objectivity. We need to be a little bit more open. And maybe we can determine why some peoples don't seem to get along with others and find better ways that we can get along with each other. Maybe something in our nature uh, makes us rub each other the wrong way, so to speak. Despite my problems with uh, uh, Diamond's lack of consideration of these points, I decided to ask the Oracle what science in general thought about the book Guns, Germs, and Steel. The Oracle being ChatGPT. I know the Oracle is a little biased. <laughs> it's got a little bit of a progressive left-wing bias in there. Uh, anyway, it cited three experts who all said that, yeah, it's a good book. It's got lots of great information in it is very broad in scope well researched but too much environmental determinism i mean what about culture and ideological factors well that's a good point but where do culture and ideology come from if not from environment genetics that's even more appalling to say that so i also think he stresses environment a little bit too much at the at the uh expense of genetics because people don't necessarily change their nature just when they move to another country just because the mongols invaded europe didn't mean they suddenly adopted european customs <laughs> and yet evolutionary biology the the science that studies this sort of thing is not much in favor and i've read a number of those books that argue you know the other direction 
as I said at the beginning, Diamond mentions he thinks that maybe New Guineans are actually smarter than Europeans on average. And it's an assertion that he makes anecdotally. He says, because New Guineans were historically illiterate, they had to keep all these details of survival in their heads. For example, topography, biology, political geography, like where are my enemies? Where do they live? Where do my friends live? All these ideas they had to keep in their heads or they died. Good point. Having good memory is indeed a um, indicator of intelligence, but it's not the only one. He didn't make any effort to quantify this. They didn't do any you know, tests on New Guineans to see how their memories compared to the memories of, of Europeans, at least not to my knowledge. The problem with a lot of Diamond's ideas is they're not provable. I mean, the continental axis theory, as, as appealing as it is, how do we say it would be different on a different world with different continents? We only have the small group that we have. You know, we only have five inhabitable com continents. And we can't experiment with other configurations. On the other hand, it's easy to see how much genetics affects us. We can uh, do DNA tests. We can do IQ tests. Uh, we can do social tests that follow how people perform in a modern industrial society based on their IQ. And uh, again, it's politically incorrect to say that there's anything to it. But, and indeed, I think that there are some things that aren't measured well by IQ, yet there is a factor. It does enter in. Really, when you think about it, the same differing environments that gave rise to different situa situations and different civilizations, they can also select for different human traits. Some might make us be more cooperative, others more competitive, depending upon uh, the, the climate, you know, whether it was harsh or whether the uh, other animals were harsh. <laughs> Evolution does not cease just because we become human. So, despite my quibbles with this book, despite my you know, theoretical questioning and my skepticism, I do highly recommend this book. It's a great book. It's not a definitive explanation. You don't want to take it on faith, but it's a great jumping off point for anybody who wants to learn more. You will learn so much, and he researched this so thoroughly. A serious reader of Guns, Germs, and Steel will come up with more questions and answers. And contravention to what the establishment and the media tells us, there is no such thing as settled science. If science becomes settled, it's no longer science, it's religion, it's ideology, it's dogma. And we can't let that happen to us just because we fear that some of the bad ideas that the Victorians had, for example, that led to bad political decisions, we just can't let that scare us from looking for the truth because we can still behave well to each other. We can still treat each other with respect. And in fact, if we know our natures, we can be even better neighbors to our diverse population, to the rest of us. Just saying. This has been my rather opinionated review of Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, published 1997, W.W. Norton. Please let me know what you think in the comments. Please like and subscribe. And please check out my works on Amazon. Links are in the description. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.